going to have some fun, going to be a great weekend. I hope you're thinking and praying of friends and family that you can bring with you to church. If you invite them, they will come. Right? Talk to them, pray for them. Let's have a great Easter season. And today we start our series leading up to Easter entitled Jesus. We simply want to look at the scripture and see Jesus, who he is, what he did, what he said, and realize that he really is the center. He's the purpose. He, he's the focus. He's everything to the Christian. Sometimes we get distracted with churchianity and we forget what's important to Christianity. So if you don't want to be a churchian and you really want to be a Christian, then let's get our eyes on Christ, right? The scripture said we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is only, only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And of course, it's speaking about Jesus. In Hebrews chapter one, it says, in the last days, God has spoken to us by his son. That's important. In the Old Testament, he spoke by prophets. He spoke in various ways. In these days, he has spoken unto us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds, who is the brightness of the glory and the express image of his person. So today we're going to find out if you see Jesus, if you know Jesus, you see the Father, you know the Father. He is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. I want to start with you in John chapter 14. We're going to read several verses. And then we'll just kind of take a look and explain and dive deeper into each of these. Probably a well-known passage. You've probably known, maybe memorized at least a part of this passage. If you've not, it's a good place to start your Bible memorization. John chapter 14 and verse 1. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. It's interesting that the Lord always approaches the heart as something you have control over. You know, you see in the romantic comedy, the heart wants what the heart wants. No, the heart wants what you tell it to want. In our world today, people have the thought, the idea that my heart can be broken and my heart can be depressed and I can be anxious and I can be worried and fearful and I can't help it. Okay, I, I'll give you a moment when you can't help it. I'll give you a moment where you're nervous, scared, worried, traumatized, whatever. However, over the course of a day, a week, a month, a year, you decide where your heart goes. And you decide if your heart is troubled or not. Maybe you spent the morning troubled, agitated, worried, fearful, and then you say, wait, let not my heart be troubled. Jesus always speaks to issues of the heart, and he always approaches it with the perspective that you're in control. You are not a victim. 
You are not a puppet that this world just gets to jerk around. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. All right, let's stop there. We'll go back to John 14 again, but let's stop at verse 6 for a moment. Jesus is the way that we live. He's the truth that is absolute and makes us free. He is the life that is abundant and eternal. He is the way, the truth, and the life. You've probably heard it said before, but it is important that you believe and that you understand. He is not a way. He's the way. He is not a truth. In our world today, a lot of people seeking for their truth. What a sad way to live. Well, my truth, and, and their truth, they understand, is temporary. Today, my truth is how I feel today, how, how I want to live today. But tomorrow, who knows? So you live with a truth that is not true. It's just a moment. You've been listening to that praise and worship band called U2. And you're just stuck in a moment. Okay, I know you got to be old, but. (laughs) So Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Every question that we have about the way to live, every struggle that we have about what is true, And every issue that we have about how we live is answered in him. Know him, follow him, understand him, listen to him, be what he is, do what he does, you'll be good. So people who are confused, people who don't understand, people who who emotionally are upset and, and, and spiritually dark and all of those struggles, that's people who, for whatever reason, choose not to look at Jesus. And if you're a Christian and in those places of darkness and confusion, you really need to stop and say, Jesus is the answer, not only for the world today, but for me and my circumstance and my situation and things I'm going through. I'm going to be like him. I'm going to approach life like him. I'm going to believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That strengthens your soul. That, that gives you a foundation. That empowers you to live an abundant life and an eternal life. It's always Jesus. It seems funny, but it's true that many Christians don't follow Christ. They they follow religion. They they follow church. They they follow preachers. They, They follow what they think is spiritual, but they don't know or maybe have never known it's all about Jesus. Jesus said, you believe in God, believe in me. He is God. And if you've not settled that, if you've, if you've not realized that, you, you need to get it. He is God. He is God the Son. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are one. You believe in one, you believe in the others. They are unique, right? Jesus said, John wrote in, about Jesus in chapter one of his gospel. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. Well, wait, how can you be with God if you are God? Yeah, you have to be God to pull that off. It was always amazing to me when people say things like this. Well, I just can't believe in the Trinity because I can't even understand how that could be. Really? We're going to establish the eternal deity of God based on what you can understand? Really, it empowers and encourages me to believe in the Trinity to realize God is way beyond what I can understand. But I can believe that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are God, and they are unique in their existence. The word Trinity isn't in the Bible. You don't have to believe in that word, but we believe in Jesus just as we believe in God. And by the way, if Jesus is just a teacher and a guru and a spiritual inspiration for you, you are lost. You're not saved because you probably have a little bit of faith in the Koran and a little bit of faith in Confucius and a little bit of faith in the vortex that you can find in Sedona, Arizona. If you get to the right spot under the red rock shadow and the sundial, I've been there. I stood in the vortex. I prayed in tongues. People create weird mystical things because they don't know truth. And people follow weird and mystical things because they don't know truth. Jesus, in this passage, tells us that he's preparing a place for us and he will return for us. This is encouraging. This is, this is amazing because this is our hope. The Bible calls the blessed hope the return of Christ and our future in heaven. The blessed hope. You can't live without hope. Without hope, you become an alcoholic. You become a drug addict. You, you start trying to medicate the pain of life. Without hope, you make foolish decisions and you let darkness consume your soul. So Jesus says, I'm preparing a place for you, and I will come again for you. Now, really, that's all you need to know about the last days. There's a place for me, and he's coming again for me. Now, we, we get creative with a lot of last day teaching, we being the church world. A lot of things have been said about the rapture and the tribulation and the millennium. The post-tribulation rapture, the mid-tribulation rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture. A lot of debates, a lot of discussion. Some of you love that stuff. You got books on the blood moon. I used to see the blood moon. If you smoke enough pot, you will always see the blood moon. In fact, tell the truth here, Russell. Your eyes look like the blood moon. Acts chapter two, the moon will be turned to blood. And yeah, so we wax eloquent. We create messages. We sell a lot of books about the last days and the rapture and this and that. Stop. Stop with all that. Don't be tricked. Don't buy in to foolish talk. Jesus made it real simple. He's coming again. There's a place for you. That's all that matters. Now let's live like him. Let's live like he lived. Let's do what he said. Let's be Christians. Right? If it's pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, cool. As long as I'm going. 
long as there's a place for me. So sometimes we get caught up in these things and, and we get a little off track. Let's don't do that. Now go back to John 14. Let's pick it up at verse 7. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Jesus said to him, uh, Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet have you not known me, Philip? Hear this now. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? The works that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So this is an important thing. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen God the Father. If Jesus did it, it's because God the Father does it. If he didn't do it, that means God the Father didn't do it. It's amazing the things that people think that God did. In general, kind of a big picture discussion, many people think God does bad things, evil things. God crashed my car. Right? And they get spiritual about it. They'll say things. I've had people tell me. I was in a car wreck, the, the, Lord, the Lord did it. The Lord crashed your car. Yeah. What kind of car do you have? Because I'm not going to get that kind. Obviously, the Lord does not like that car. Well, no, the Lord crashed my car because when I was in the hospital, I was looking up, and I began to think about him. So that's why he crashed your car. Yeah, because I was looking. I said, man, you're slow to learn, aren't you? <laughs> Pretty sure God could have told you to look up to him without crashing your car. But we get spiritual and we get weird. We create things. Okay, so let's go with your idea that God crashed your car. Or whatever it was, God broke your leg when you were skiing. We won't talk about the fact that you're a lousy skier. <laughs> but God broke your leg. Or whatever happened, right? People say a lot of things. God did it, and it was, it was an accident, or it was a, a problem. And so the Lord did it to try to, you know, save me or he, whatever he did. Okay, so let's go with that argument. Do you remember the day when Jesus took a shepherd's staff and beat the snot out of a guy? Upside the head. Bam, bam. Bam, knocked him on the ground, beat him, beat him, beat him. And as he walked away, the Lord said, now that you're on the ground, look up. <laughs> Keep looking up. See if you can find the Father through your black and blue eyes. I can't even see God. My eyes are swole shut. Of course not. Why? Because Jesus didn't do that. He never broke somebody's leg. He never knocked somebody down. He never punched their lights out. He never made them sick. God gave me cancer. No, he didn't. Just God's shadow heals people. How's God going to give you cancer? No. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Now, here's what some people do. They get struck. They say, well, in the Old Testament... Okay, first of all, Old Testament, limited revelation. No revelation of the devil, no revelation of spiritual warfare, very little insight into the things of the spirit. And I just read to you Hebrews chapter one, in these last days, God has spoken unto us by his son. 
everything you can know about the Father is manifested in the Son. So just settle it. Don't try to sort out all the Old Testament stories. You're not in the Old Testament. You're in the New Testament. You have Jesus. You have a greater insight and a greater revelation. In the Old Testament, you couldn't get born again. You couldn't get filled with the Holy Spirit. How are you going to understand spiritual warfare? You didn't have the name above every name, the name of Jesus. So we live in such a better time with a better promise. So keep your eyes on that truth. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. You understand what the Father does when you watch what Jesus does. Now, John 14 and verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, what does it mean to believe? Is it a feeling? Is believing a feeling? Well, sometimes it creates a feeling, but it's more than a feeling. Believing in its simplest, most basic definition is a choice. I asked Dr. Cho, pastor of the largest church in the world, Seoul, Korea. I said, Dr. Cho, what is faith? What, what, what does it mean to believe? He said, to decide, to choose. And here's where people struggle. They want a feeling. Before they can believe in God or believe in Jesus, they want to feel something. What, what would that feeling be? If I slapped you, would that do it? That's a feeling. Can you feel that? Would that do it? A feeling. Right? If I punch you in the stomach, is that the feeling? What is the believing feeling? We sing songs about it. We probably shouldn't, but you know, we never let truth ruin a good song. Right? But we sing the song, I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, we don't, but I mean, somebody does. <laughs> Tasha won't sing because it's not scriptural, but some people do. So what is that everything's going to be all right feeling? Okay, well, I go back to my original premise, two or three joints or a couple hits of tequila, and you got a feeling <laughs> everything's going to be all right. Not that I know, but I've heard. You know what I'm saying? I really don't know that, but I've heard that. And really, that's where people are at. They want that feeling like a drug. They want that feeling like alcohol. They want to feel it so they believe. Okay, faith is not a feeling. Believing in God is not a feeling. It's a choice. It's a decision. You decide. I believe in God. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. You decide. I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. You decide. And then because of your decision, you study and you grow in that decision. And there are moments where you really feel it, where the the emotions of it and the impact of it cause a feeling. But there are always days, no, okay, I've been saying almost 50 years now, and there are days when I got no feeling except headaches and and anxiety. But I go back to my decision, I believe, I believe. And maybe the best prayer you can pray is, Lord, I believe. I believe in you. I believe your word. I believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. I believe. That's a choice. That's a decision. I chose to marry Wendy. Today, regardless of how I feel, I choose to be married to Wendy. Why you laugh? They're laughing. Huh? I know. It's a privilege. It's a blessing. Sometimes it's a lot. (laughs) 
It's like yesterday. Wendy says, hey, I'm going to go watch Moses' new play, Martin Luther King. You take care of my house. <laughs> what? Now, I'm the babysitter. I'm Papa. Mahal and I eat a lot of things mom doesn't know about. <laughs> I know, it's bad when you have to say to your grandchildren, let's not tell mom about this. <laughs> I said, Mahal, he's only two. Mahal, let's not tell mom. Mahal's like, who? <laughs> Just kidding, teasing. Okay, John 14, verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, he who chooses to believe, he who makes that decision to believe, the works that I do, he'll do also, and greater works than these he'll do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We pray to the Father in the name, by the authority of the life of Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit does the work. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God, hears and answers our prayer. We pray to the Father in the name. Okay, now here's another little thing that we do. Just, just want to encourage you, stay scriptural, stay biblical. A lot of people plead the blood. Christian people, church people, and that's okay. But there's no scripture for that. Plead the blood. We used to have old uh, apostolic man, Lester Summerall, would come to our church. Passed away years ago. You know, you know it's sad when a lot of your friends have passed away years ago. And Brother Summerall used to point at the worship leader and he would say, sing those blood songs. Yeah, yeah. And we just start going, the blood, the blood, the blood. And Brother Summerall would plead the blood over people, which is okay. It's not a bad thing. Obviously, the blood of Jesus is, is where salvation starts. But we're told in the scripture, in the name of Jesus. That's where the authority is. The name that is above every name. Every knee must bow. Every tongue confess to that name. So I'm just, I'm just saying to you, we're serious about this stuff. We're in this word. Way up in there. And the word said, believe in the Father and believe in me and do the works that I do how do you do that? You pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. So what are those works? Well, we love people like Jesus loved people. We, we teach people like Jesus taught people. We, we, we pray for people like Jesus prayed for people. We help people, heal people. We give like Jesus gave. Let's get real with our faith and make sure that our faith has works that back it up. Are you saved by works? Nope. But if you got real faith, you got works that back it up. You're loving, you're giving, you're serving, you're praying, you're ministry to, right? If there's no action in your life that says you're a Christian, you need to check yourself. Right, if you tell people at, your, at the work, where you work, I'm a Christian, and they're like, no. <laughs> You're kidding, right? You need to check yourself. Because Jesus said, if you believe the works I do, you'll do also. Loving, caring, praying, giving, expecting miracles. Let's be like Christ. It's always about Jesus and believing in him. The way, the truth, and the life. Close your eyes with me.